is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to Bible Talk and our Bible studies here. And uh, today we're going to be starting a new series in the letter to James, the letter of James, the letter from James. I know I can get it. The bond servant. The bond servant. Amen. Uh, it'll be as we typically do, going verse by verse, so I don't know how long it'll take. Uh, hopefully it'll get through before the Lord comes back, or even more hopefully he'll be back before we get through. So, I like that. Yeah. Yeah. So, we'll see. But I do suggest that you have your Bible open, you have uh, perhaps be able to take some notes. And remember this, to test all things and hold fast that which is good. Don't take my word for anything. Check it. And, and probably more important than hearing what we're saying from here today is that once it's done, that you would contemplate it, that you would meditate on it, that you would have a conversation with the Lord about what you hear, which is a good thing to do in all of your spiritual life. Amen. Okay? Remembering, first of all, that it is hearing the voice of God, not the voice of me, Amen. that builds faith in your life, ever important faith. Testing everything by the word. By the word. Amen. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you and praise you that you give us this opportunity. And, Lord, above all, we thank you for your word. We especially thank you for your word made flesh who dwelt among us. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, that living word, Lord God. And I, I pray that you would just, because of your Holy Spirit in us, that sent to lead us to all truth, that we would grow in our understanding of your plan in our lives, your purpose in our lives through this study. So I just ask that, Father, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. All right, so as I said, we're going to be studying the letter to James. And now I want to start with a couple of things before we get actually into the Word. A little preface. Well, yeah, it is, because I don't know how familiar you are with this, but Martin Luther um, was not pleased with the letter of James. No, he wasn't. He actually called it a letter of straw. And that's because he thought there was a conflict be between the teaching of Paul on faith and faith alone and the letter of James, which talks so much about works. I promise you, as we go through, you'll see that there's absolutely no conflict whatsoever. And the other thing that you might be interested in is the fact that uh, we know that this letter is from James, but we don't know who that is. Right. Remember, I mean, there were two apostles who were named James. There was the brother of Jesus who was named James. So, you know, we don't know which of those folks God used to bring this letter forth. Um, I was reading somewhere and they said that if you would think that if he was Jesus' brother, that maybe he would have made some mention of it. And I would say, no, not, not if he was the humble man that I was no, speaking that's here. True. That's true. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's not that the Lord doesn't want us to know mm -hmm. who wrote it. It's coming it's, from God. It's because he truly, he wants us to know truly who the author actually is. Right. Remember, in 2 Peter, it says this. Second, I'm going to read 2 Peter 1, 20 and 21. But know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Amen. This is God speaking to us. Yes. You can't lose sight of that, right? I mean, it's not about... I, I thank God for those who went before us. I thank God for, for James. I thank God for Paul, for Titus, for mm -hmm. Peter. And, but the fact of the matter is we need to hear from God. And it is God who is speaking to us, all right? So just remember that. And I'm sure that they were imitators of Jesus. Well, and Jesus I'm, didn't speak anything that he didn't hear from the Father. From the Father, yes. So... And, and bear in mind, you know, what we have studied in the past, it, it says in Second Timothy, that all scripture is God breathed. So the word here is literally the breath of God that brings life. Okay. All right. So it starts out by saying, James, a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes who are dispersed abroad. 
Greetings. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The first thing is that he's a bond servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. He doesn't make claims, and he, he may, he, he's very likely he was either an apostle or the brother of Jesus. As Alice has said, he doesn't point out that fact. What he does point out that he's a bond servant. Yes. Right? And that's, you know, the reason lies in, the, in this first chapter, in, the, in verse 9, because it talks about the fact that. The, it says, but the brother of humble circumstances is to glory in his high position. Well, you know what? Bond servant is the highest position you can have. Yes, it is. Well, That's it's true. true. I mean, Absolutely. you know, don't don't let the world get you upside down. Mm -hmm. Bowing before God, humbling yourself is what God will cause God to exalt you and lift you up. You know, it's not it's not the big title or the the fancy title or the fancy. It is the fact that you are a bond servant of Jesus Christ that is the most powerful thing in your life. Don't worry about it. Be right? used by God. Mm. But you know what a bond servant is? I, you know, let's let's talk about that for just a second, right? Uh, let me read you this verse from Deuteronomy. This is in Deuteronomy chapter fifteen. I'm going to read verses fifteen and uh, uh, sixteen and seventeen. Rather. It says, it shall come about if he, talking about a freed slave, and the slave has been freed, says to you, I will not go out from you because he loves you and your household. Since he fares well with you, then you shall take an all and pierce it through his ear and the door, and he shall be your servant forever. That's a bond servant, somebody who's been set free. And remember, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. It is because we have made a choice we want, we desire to serve God. That's a bond servant. And the next thing here is the recipient of the letter. When, when James was writing this, it says he was writing to the 12 tribes who were dispersed, where the King James says scattered abroad. The people of God. He's writing to the people of God. Yes. Okay? Yes, the Jews. We need to remember that you should be proclaiming the good news of Jesus Christ to the unsaved. But if they can't understand it, don't be surprised. Mm -hmm. And if they're not willing to receive it, don't be surprised. It takes the grace of God and the Spirit of God at work in their life. Unless the Father draws them, no man's going to come, right? Unless the Spirit draws them. It says too, and I want to read Mark 13, verses 26 and 27. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the farthest end of the earth to the farthest end, farthest end of heaven. That's us. You know, it says, for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. That's in Romans 15, 4. I pray that you will grow in your hope and your understanding through this time. All right, so let me let me just go on in here. We're up to verse two. Okay. Because verse two, and I'm going to read two, yes. two through four, starts this way. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let Endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So it didn't take any time at all for James to get into. This isn't going to, this isn't necessarily going to be an easy ride. All right. Unlike most of what the seems like the, the church is preaching today, where it's all, you know, come and you just get all this stuff or it's going to be, you have to be prepared. Jesus said, count the cost. You need to know what it is to, to serve Jesus Christ, all right? The world hated him. The world's going to hate us. Many of the afflictions of the righteous. We are going to have those trials and tribulations in our life. You can't escape that. So James is not going to put it off here. Let's get right into it and understand that, all right? But the purpose is so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. You know, this is not... Something that James thought up. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans, and he said, Not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, 
and perseverance, proven character. And proven character, hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. Romans 5, it's 3 through 5, all right? So this tribulation, this trying, this testing, these attacks of the devil tend to serve a different purpose in God's plan. Not to cause us harm, but to build us up, strengthen us, and improve us. And Peter was in perfect agreement with that. Because Peter wrote in his letter, in his first letter to the aliens and scattered, that's us, right? He said, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 1 Peter 1, verses 6 through 7. Amen. It's fertilizer. Amen. It's fertilizer. You know, I did a teaching, I've done a teaching a number of times on how we are to cultivate faithfulness. Yes. And the simple fact is that the first thing, when God put Adam in the garden, he put him in the garden to cultivate. Mm -hmm. And I, I, this teaching talks about the different things. And, and I'm, I'm a city boy. I grew up in New York City. So I didn't know much about this farming. kind of farming. I'm not farmer brand. But it's about knowing that you have to plow the ground. And tear it up. you got to tear it up. To, to make room for the new, you got to tear it up, right? But one of the things that you have to do to be... A, to have a successful growth in your, is your fertilizing. Right. A stinky stuff. And, you know, like I said, I, I grew up in New York City. I had no farm experience. I didn't have any planting experience. The only plants I liked were the plastic ones because you're not going to take any care of them. And they don't even make plastic ones anymore. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Tempest Fugit, as we say in Rome. Yeah. Silk. Silk. Yeah. But the idea was. Alice and I went, and we had another couple traveling with us, and I was going out to the Midwest to preach for a while. Uh, and we were in Kansas and Missouri, and and that was the first time I experienced, I, like I said, I, I may sound very naive, but I probably was when it came to this, that people were buying, ready for this? Fertilizer. <laughs> they were paying good cash money for cow poop. That's right. Fertilizer. So, you know how... The, the, the crop is the most important thing to them. That's their life. That's their it's life. Their right. And they take this, it's so precious to them. They take it and they dump all this stuff on them. So what's grow. going on here? Well, when the devil attacks us, that's God allowing him to do that because it's just fertilizer. Mm -hmm. It makes us grow. And that's what, that's what James is saying. That's what Paul is saying. That's what Peter is saying. Right? And you don't have to be concerned. I'm telling you, God has it covered. I was thinking about this, and I was thinking about in the book of Esther, you know the story of Haman? Mm -hmm. Let me just read you something from Esther, Esther, and I'm going to read from the seventh chapter, verses 9 and 10. Now it took place in the days of Ahasuerus, when Haman plotted to destroy the Jews, that Harbona, one of the eunuchs who were with the king, said, Behold, indeed, the gallows standing at Haman's house, fifty cubits high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke good on behalf of the king. And the king said, hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows, which he had prepared for Mordecai, and the king's anger subsided. You know, that's what it says in Psalm 21, in, in verse 11. It says, though they intended evil against you and devised a plot, it will not. they will not succeed. It's the same thing that Isaiah said. And that means that... These are things you need to think about. You might want to jot them down and spend time meditating on them later. Because in Isaiah chapter 8, God spoke to him to say, devise a plan. He's talking to the devil. Go ahead, devise a plan, but it will be thwarted. State a proposal, but it will not stand. For God is with us. For thus the Lord spoke to me with mighty power and instructed me not to walk in the way of this people, saying, you are not to say it is a conspiracy. I was thinking about that today. In regard to all this people call a conspiracy. And you are not to fear what they fear or be in dread of it. It is the Lord of hosts whom you should regard as holy. 
and he shall be your fear, and he shall be your dread. I, that's what I said, Isaiah 8, 10 through 13. There's not a lot of teaching I hear in, in churches about the fear of the Lord. There's an awful lot in the word about the fear of the Lord. And I'm just going to say this. You show me a man who fears the Lord, and I'll show you a man who fears no man. And not fear anything that, that man can do to you. Now, we're going through some trying times in the world right now today. I mean, with the coronavirus here in the United States, it's not just the coronavirus, it's the economic condition. It's it's the protests, otherwise known as riots. And I mean, all this violence is going on. I don't have any fear. No. And I have no need to have fear. You say, well, you know, I, I understand perfectly. But what can man do to me? If God is for me, what can man do to me? We are safe and secure in the palm of his hand. In the palm of his hand. Amen. Oh, you don't understand. They can kill you. Hallelujah. They can kill me to death. Straight to the throne room. Just send us home. So we know that all things, including the trials and tribulations, work for our good. That's what it says in Romans 8.28. But more importantly, they'll work for God's glory in our life, in our life and through our life. And that should be a great desire of ours. You see, the purpose of a testimony is to glorify God, not to boast in ourselves. We need to understand that. Not to boast in our pastor, not to boast in our congregation, not to boast in our denomination. Not to boast in our works. Not to boast in anything other than if any man boasts, let him boast in the Lord. So the apostles preaching in the name of Jesus... Remember this in Jerusalem? Mm -hmm. They were arrested and then beaten by the council and the high priest. For what? For preaching the name of Jesus. Right. They were beaten. And it says, so they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. Acts 5, 41. What did the apostles do? They said, well, you're trying to bring this man's blood on us. Mm -hmm. Hallelujah. That's exactly right. Covered by the blood. Of we Jesus. want to bring Jesus' blood on people that we meet. Because it's only by that blood can they be made righteous, be cleansed of their sin, and come to a right relationship with the Lord. It's amazing what unsaved people can say in ignorance. The guy says, Oh yeah, oh yeah. So think about the things that happen. I, you know, as a matter of fact, we just did a, a Bible right that went out this past week about when Paul was shipwrecked. On, on the island of Malta, not only Paul, but uh, everybody that was with him, the sailors, the soldiers, the other prisoners. And as soon as they land, Paul is gathering firewood. They, you know, they're shipwrecked. They're, anyway, they're coming out, and the snake grabs on the Paul. He shakes it loose and keeps on going. When will we get to that place where things go wrong in our life, we can just shake it off and keep on going? Knowing that we are safe and secure from all alarm. We have to practice. You're going to be tried. Mm -hmm. There's no doubt about it, okay? In the world, you have, the world doesn't love us. No. And I pray that you don't love the world. We are not friends of the world. No, we need to love the people yes. and proclaim the good news to them, but we're not to love the world or the things of the world, okay? So when all is said and done, just remember this. When he has tried us, it says, I shall come forth as fine gold. That's what Job said. I'll come forth as fine gold when I've been tried. Okay. We're going to jump right up now, and I'm going to start reading in verse 5. We're zipping right along. Do, do yourself a favor, and something strikes you. Make a little note so you can go back and spend time. Time in the Word, time with the Lord, and meditate on it. Starting at verse 5, it says, But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. So don't ever think that this is not a, a letter of faith. Absolutely. Absolutely, it is. If you lack wisdom, I, you know, 
When was the last time you prayed for wisdom? I mean, you, you may have prayed for this and prayed for that. Every day. How, how much of our prayer life is, is used up? I don't guess you'll run out of it. But, but it's used up by concerns for the natural little material things. Pray for wisdom. Go read the book of Proverbs and see how much of that is about having wisdom. Okay. Wisdom is about properly applying knowledge, knowing how to properly use the knowledge that God gives us. Okay. Something can be good and it can be used for bad. And I, I made myself a note here that remember Alfred Nobel invented dynamite. Mm -hmm. It can be properly or improperly applied. I mean, he didn't make it to kill people, right? So you need wisdom. You need wisdom. And we're going to talk about this because James is going to talk about it. We need wisdom from God, wisdom from above, all right? So let me just read that verse again, right? But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all generously without reproach. If you ask for wisdom, God is going to give it to you. He sent the Holy Spirit into your life. To lead you into all truth, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith without any doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being a double minded man, unstable in all his ways. When you pray and you ask, do you ask expecting? I know that John wrote in his, in his letter, First John, and he said, if you ask anything in his will, in God's will, you know that he hears you. And if he hears you, you're going to receive it. So you have a right to pray expecting. Okay? And if it's God's will, you're going to receive it. If it's not God's will, pray that you don't receive it. Pray, I mean, pray that you don't receive it. I mean, there, there, are, times, and there are times that you can find in Scripture when people pray for things that were not the will of God. And sad to say, sometimes they got it. And it didn't do them any, it did them a lot of harm, right? Instead of praying in, in faith, they're, they're praying in hope. Well, hoping that God will. You do can't it. be, if it's not God's will, you can't be faith. Right. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the, from the word, by, by God, right? So if you're praying for something and you didn't hear it from God, you can't possibly be praying in faith. So are you praying God's will or are you praying his will? Praying God's will or praying your will. Your you is. <laughs> man. Well, I mean, yeah. that's an important thing. Yeah. yeah. You should rejoice if you pray for something and don't get it. If you have that relationship with God, knowing that if he didn't give it to you, there's a reason for it. Right. I, you know, we, we talk about this a number of times. Because his ways are so much higher than ours. An awful lot of times over the years. That Paul, who had, was being tested with a thorn in his flesh, went before God and prayed, Lord, you know, take this away from me. And there was silence in heaven when God didn't answer. So he went back a second time and prayed, God, please take this away from me. And you don't know what period of time this was, you know, in between. How long? No, you don't. Yeah. No. Uh, it, pr it probably was some time. Yeah. Paul is a man who had a heart for God. So, and so a third time he go, a third time he goes before the Lord and said, "Lord, please remove this thorn in the flesh." And God finally answers him and says, "No." Well, that was the right answer, and praise God, that's what blessed Paul, because you know he said, "My my grace is sufficient, and your your strength is perfected in weakness." God has a plan. God wants what is best for you. Sometimes we don't pray for what's best for us. We pray for what we think feels good, right? And we can't we can't fathom the plan that God has. We really can't. Because <clears throat> you try to think of this is the reason he's doing this, or that's the reason he's doing it. And it's not because it's so we can't even think of the reason he's doing it. Because it's so out of our realm. His ways are still not our ways. His ways are higher than our ways. So much higher. But the one thing that you can consistently trust in is the fact that he loves you. Absolutely. So you know he has a plan for good. For your good and for his glory. And that's what we should be satisfied with. I think God said, I know the plans that I have for you. Yes. yes. And so, yeah. yeah. 
So he's in control. Well, absolutely, and it, it is wisdom to have that in mind as you in, in your prayer life, right? But you know, in addition to wisdom, there's also intelligence, knowledge, mm -hmm. and understanding. Okay, yes. those things are not exactly wisdom, but they're all part of what makes up wisdom. They're all there as part of it, right? Let me give you some facts. A person can be intelligent without having knowledge, right? Okay. There, there are people who are very, very intelligent, but they've not been given knowledge, either, right? A person can have knowledge without being intelligent. Think about these, right? A person can be intelligent and have knowledge without being wise. That's wisdom. Yeah. You need to, I need to, we need to seek God's wisdom. Because intelligence comes from the Latin word that means understanding. And I'm going to give you a definition from the dictionary. A very general mental capacity, capability, that among other things involves the ability to reason, plan, solve problems, think abstractly, abstractly comprehend complex ideas, learn quickly and learn from experience. It's not merely book learning, a narrow academic skill or test taking smarts. Rather, it reflects a broader and deeper capability for comprehending our surroundings, catching on, making sense with, of, of things or figuring out what to do. But you don't have to do that because you're not, it says in Proverbs, you don't have to lean on your own understanding. You need to seek that from God. And knowledge is about having a set of facts. You just have the facts. Having specific information about something, right? The question is, is what you know true? I promise you, I, I bet you there's a lot of things that you believe that you think are true and are not. Because you live in a world that is filled and controlled by the father of lies, right? There are a lot of lies out there. So... <laughs> I mean, think about what you know and what you don't know. Do you know that it's impossible to walk on water? Yeah. Do you? Oh, for, for me it was, is, I, I've tried it. <laughs> but not for Peter, not for Jesus. I think I've read this someplace. Nothing. Is impossible with God. Nothing is impossible with God. It just depends on what God is speaking to you. Right. Because there are a lot of things you think are true. But when God steps in, they ain't necessarily so, all right? Understanding is not just knowing that something works. It's about knowing how it works, all right? Probably everybody here knows. I mean, you go down, you have a car, you go down, you, you start it up, and do you have any idea how that internal combustion engine works? Do you need to? Yeah, do you even think about it? All right? It's like what you've always used before is the light switch. Because there's a lot of things that you don't need to know. You just need to oh, hear and obey when it comes to the things you're of the Spirit. You're expecting it to, to do what you're intending it to do. Wisdom, well, what, what is wisdom? Wisdom is the knowledge of truth properly applied. Okay, that's, that's wise. Wisdom is knowing how to properly apply your knowledge of the truth, it tells you what to do. There's so much going on in the world today, and it's it's because nobody is paying attention, and they just do what they want. But the wisdom of the world is earthly, natural, natural and demonic, demonic. Which, which James is going to talk about. We're going to get there. But where does wisdom come from? Where, where do you think wisdom comes from? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to read Psalm 111, verse 10, because God knows where it comes from. The fear of the Lord. We just talked about that. The fear of the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. Proverbs 2, 6. It's about the fear of the Lord. That's where, that's where wisdom starts. Let me read you something from Job. All right, I'm going to start in Job 28. I'm going to start in verse 12. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value. 
nor is it found in the land of the living. The deep says it's not in me, and the sea says it's not with me. Pure gold cannot be given in exchange for it, nor can silver be weighed as its price. It cannot be valued in gold in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold or glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for articles of fine gold. Coral and crystal are not to be mentioned, and the acquisition of wisdom is above that of pearls. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from, and where is the place of understanding? Thus it is hidden from the eyes of all living, and concealed from the birds of the sky. Abaddon and death say, with our ears we have heard a report of it. God understands its way, and he knows its place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he imparted weight to the wind and meted out the waters by measure, when he set a limit for the rain and a course for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and also searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28, 12 through 28. Take that to heart. Think about it. I mean, don't just listen to this stuff. Even if you read it, think about it, ponder it, meditate on it. You need to meditate on God's word. Do you know what's wise and what's foolish? Do you really? Well, let me read you something else. Remember, we just got through with a study on this subject. For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the cleverness of the clever I will set aside. Where is the wise man? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since the wisdom of God for since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. For indeed, Jews ask for signs and Greeks search for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. To Jews a stumbling block and to the Gentiles foolishness, but to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, because the wisdom of the, the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brethren, that there were not many wise according to the flesh, nor mighty, and not many noble, but God has chosen the foolish things of this world to shame the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to shame the things which are strong, and the base things of the world, the despise God has chosen, the things that are not, so that he may nullify the things that are, so that no man may boast before God. But by his doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption, so that just as it is written, that him who boasts, boasts in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, that's verses 18 to 31. Think of that. What do you know? What do you understand? What wisdom do you have? God's ways are not our ways. The world is, the, all the things that the world has been teaching you, have you been listening to the world? That may, that may be the fake news that everybody's talking about, Right? We're not to be hearers of the word, just hearers of the word. We're supposed to be doers of the word. We're supposed to be doers of God's word properly applied. Right? And remember, it says, He gives who gives to all generously and without reproach. Now, to him who is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. That's what it says in Ephesians 3.20. No, you know, I, I, I think uh, we'll stop here and wait to go on next week, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so we're going to pick this up again next week in the sixth and seventh verses of the first chapter. 
And I, I pray, like I said, that you that you hear what I'm saying, but more importantly, that you hear what God is saying, and you talk to the Lord about what you're hearing. All right? Do you spend time meditating on the word? Do you spend time pondering on the word? And then most importantly, then do you spend time applying the word in your life? Because if you're not applying it in your life, it will never become the reality of your life. And that's what James is going to talk about here in this letter. Doers of the word. Doers of the word, not just hearers. So, Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for our brother James, whoever he was, Lord God. For his faithfulness to you, to be used by you, a bondservant of the Most High God. And Father, I pray that through his teaching, through this word that you, you sent to us through him, that we would grow in our wisdom, that we would grow in our understanding, that we would grow in our faithfulness to you. And Lord, that we and not the things that we do would bring glory to your name. Amen and hallelujah. Well, it's been a blessing. Remember, you can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. We'd love to hear from you. Even if it's just to tell us where you're listening from. Yes. And then until next same week. Hello. And next week we'll pick up here at the same, same, same time, same channel, same. same station. Pray for us. We'll pray for you. If you have prayer requests, you can send them to prayer at BibleTalk.com. And we will send it out to our prayer team. So until next time, God bless you and goodbye. Bye-bye.